Each of these units is the same as any other so far as it has the character of the average labor power of society and takes effects as such. That is, so far as it requires for production of a commodity, no more time than is needed on an average, no more than is socially necessary. The labor time socially necessary is that required to reduce an article under the normal conditions of production and with the average degree of skill and intensity prevalent at the time. We see then that which determines the magnitude of the value of any article is the amount of labor socially necessary or the labor time socially necessary for its production. The concept of socially necessary labor is the appropriate answer to Bohm Barwick's rare butterfly challenge to Adam Smith, a rare butterfly that took more effort to capture than a beaver or deer would not carry more exchange value than those commonly useful items, unless the effectual demand for the butterfly was sufficient to recompense the labor of capturing it. In most cases, therefore, the market for such rare butterflies would consist of rich eccentrics, and the effectual demand for them would support only small numbers, number of laborers. As a result, the market price would inform superfluous butterfly hunters that most of their labor was socially unnecessary. The labor would be withdrawn from such production until the price was sufficient to recompense the labor of capturing them, or catching them. The co classical political economists and the Marxists, as much as Austrians, understood that labor expanded on production for much for which there it was no demand was a sunken cost. The Neo-Ricardian Ronald Meek interpreted the term value as Marx used it to mean something like equilibrium price in neoclassical economics. It is important to note at the outset that Marx's theory of value like those of Smith and Ricardo did not pretend to explain any prices other than, other than those at which supply and demand equilibrate each other and therefore cease to act. The price in which Marx was primarily interested were those which manifested themselves at the point where supply and demand balanced or equilibrated one another. The very fact that the forces of supply and demand did actually balance at this point was taken by Marx as an indication that the level of equilibrium price could not be adequately explained merely in terms of the interaction of these forces. The relation of supply and demand could certainly explain deviations from the equilibrium price, but it could not explain the level of the e equilibrium price itself. It was, in fact, precisely through the fluctuations in supply and demand that the law of value operated to determine the equilibrium price. Prices then might diverge from values in cause where supply and demand did not balance. Just as Marx's concept of value involved an abstraction from utility, so the theory of the determination of equilibrium price based upon it involved a similar abstraction from demand in common with his classical predecessors. Marx assumed that changes in demand would not in themselves bring about changes in the long run equilibrium prices of the commodities concerned, but this is not at all to say that Marx ignored demand. It remained true, as he emphasized G or A, that a commodity had to be in demand before it could possess exchange value. B, that changes in demand, in demand might cause the actual market price of a commodity to deviate from its equilibrium price. C, that prices under conditions of monopoly was determined only by the eagerness of the purchasers to buy and by the solvency. And D, that demand was the main force determining the proportion of social labor allocated to any given product productive sector at any given time. Of course, as Marshall later pointed out, this irrelevance of demand to equilibrium price was complicated by the fact that the level of affected demand might uh, affect the scale of production and thereby also affect unit costs of production. Meek criticized Villafredo Parito 
in very nearly the same terms as we have criticized Bo and Barwick for his attacks on a straw man version of Marx's labor theory of value. All too often, the imaginary Marxists with whom Pareto argues are made to put forward interpretations of the labor theory which are suspiciously simple-minded. For example, it is easy enough to show that the labor theory does not apply to rare pictures, etc. Since, as Pareto well knew, it was never intended to apply to anything other than freely reproducible goods, nor is it sufficient when the Marxists characterize as exceptional the case of the picture whose price increases when its painted, uh, painted becomes famous without anything having happened to the quantity of labor embodied in it to reply that it is by no means exceptional because the prices of all commodities may vary without anything happening to the quantity of labor embodied in them, e.g. on account of a change in the tastes and incomes of their consumers. The proper reply to such criticism, Meek argued, was that the long-run equilibrium price of freely reproducible commodities, as distinct from their day-to-day -day market prices, will not in fact be affected by a change in demand unless it is accompanied by a change in the conditions of production. Finally, since our version of the labor theory of value owes more to Benjamin Tucker than to Marx, it is only appropriate to provide some examples in which Tucker acknowledged exceptions to the labor theory. Tucker accepted the existence of short-term quasi-rents on commodities for which demand had increased, or commodities for which new production processes had been introduced. Like the classicals and Marx, he viewed, the competi uh, viewed competition as the mechanism by which price would be reduced to cost. When market entry was free and goods were freely reproducible, it is true that the usefulness of the laborer's product has a tendency to enhance its price, but this tendency is immediate offset whenever uh, competition is possible. By the rush of laborers to create this product which lasts until the price falls back to normal wages of labor, Tucker also recognized that economic rent on land with advantages, advantages in location or fertility would persist even when absentee landlord rent was abolished, and he likewise viewed producer surpluses resulting from superior innate skill as analogous to economic rent on land, and thus as inevitable even with the abolition of privilege. Although abolishing the land monopoly would reduce rent a very small fraction of its preset portion proportions, some would still remain. The remaining fraction, nevertheless, would be the cause of no more inequality than arises from unearned increment derived by almost every industry from the aggregation of people or from the unearned increment of superior natural ability, superior natural ability which even under the operation of the cost principle will probably always enable some individuals, individuals to get higher wages than the average rate. In response to the question of how one could justify the recip receipt of the equivalent of 500 days labor by the process processor possessor of an especially especially fertile piece of land for only 300 days of his own, Tucker responded that such justification would be precisely as difficult difficult as it would be to show that the man of superior skill, native not acquired, who produces in the ratio of 500 to another 300 is e equitably entitled to this surplus exchange value. Tucker was willing to accept his such permanent scarcity rents as necessary evils. He distinguished between com competitive disabilities which resulted from human meddlesomeness and those which did not, unlike usury and, and landlord rent, which resulted from the coercively maintained legal privileges of owners of capital and land, the remaining forms of producer surplus resulted only from general circumstances or acts of God, and were therefore not exploit exploitative. 
the evils involved in creating a coercive mechanism to iron out such inequalities and collect payment from free riders would exceed the evils of the inequalities themselves. To directly enforce equality of material well-being in, is meddlesome, invasive, and offensive, but to directly enforce equality of liberty is simply protective and defensive. The latter is native and aims only to prevent the establishment of artificial inequalities. The former is positive and aims at direct and uh, active abolish, uh, abolition of natural inequalities. How are we to remove the injustice of allowing one man to enjoy what another has earned? I do not expect it ever to remove to be removed altogether, but I believe that for every dollar that would be enjoyed by tax dodgers under anarchy, a thousand dollars are now enjoyed by men who have got possession of the earnings of others through special industrial, commercial, and financial privileges granted them by authority in violation of a free market. Forcibly charging a man for the producer's surplus resulting from his superior skill or superior fertility of his land would be at least as unjust as allowing him to keep it. If it is unearned, certainly his neighbors did not earn it. If the cost principle of value cannot be realized otherwise than by compulsion, then it, is, it had bit better not be realized.